Welcome to the WTF, Where's the Focus podcast. I'm going to bring you a weekly short message on where you put your focus as it relates to sales and building successful business relationships. Knowing where your focus goes, your energy flows. I'm Dan Mangianelli, the author of the books, Wake Up, Jumpstart the Life You've Always Had in Mind, and Shake It Up, Big Dreams and Bold Choices on the Road to Success. I'm a national speaker on staying motivated and inspired with the right mindset and coach top salespeople around the nation. So let's get going with WTF. Yes. Look at that. And charge. Bring me down. Just perfect from there. Welcome to the WTF. We're the Focus Podcast. Number nine. Always we're almost at double digits. What are you doing here? Actually doing work today. I like to see it. Not even looking at me. It's a dark room. We're in the middle of the dog days of summer. What does that mean? You know what the dog days of summer means? Yeah, I know. I keep saying stuff that I hear that I have no one. Let's look it up right now. I'll do some research on here. Dog days of summer. They're the hot, sultry days of summer, boys, or historically the period following the halatial rising of the star system, Sirius, which uh, astrology connected to heat, drought, sudden thunderstorms, lethargy, <laughs> that's just a board I made up. Fever, bad dogs, and bad luck. I should really look things up before I speak, if you think about it. Um, so I was just at the dog days of summer. So we're in southern fever, mad dogs, and heat. Yep, that's what you get here at the WTF. Hey, listen, fasten your seatbelts. We have a real name this time on the WTF. We have a real guest, not just the knucklehead me and my two boys here. You have an actual guest right now. We're going to get so many followers, I'm going to be able to pay you to in money rather than Skittles and Fanta orange soda. What do you think of that? You can make some money? No, <laughs> you get a courtesy laugh. What is our big name on the WF? It's singer, songwriter, prominent recording producer, Marshall Altman. He was born in New York, Rockland County, moved to Los Angeles, now lives in Nashville with his family. Went to high school in Huntington Beach, attended UC Santa Barbara for his major in business and minor in music. He left Santa Barbara before finishing his, isn't that dropping out? When you leave before? Well, okay. And then went to the Grove School of Music in Los Angeles. Uh, finishing Grove, he began to work as a music programmer in Los Angeles. Opened his first recording studio in the 90s. While running the studio, he did some work in sophomore with Capital EMI, eventually moving to A&R department. During that time, he formed a band called Farmer in 1985, and signed with Aware Records, and released an album in 1997. That's what you heard, kind of, before you this Farmer, by the way. While on the road with Farmer, he served as an A&R scout for Capital, uh, listening to submissions. Those submissions uh, got him an artist called Citizen Cope. He was awarded an executive A&R and focused on A&R, keeping his career for years. During the time, he moved from Capitol Records to Hollywood Records, finally to Columbia Records, where he principled Katy Perry and One Republic. During the last years of an A&R in Columbia, he also began working on a record producing. His early work includes Mark Bouchard and Todd Carey's. Uh, his production company, Galt Line Music, he produces a variety of artists with successful albums. Um, as Kate Vogel's Don't Look Back, and Matt Nathanson's Some Mad Hope, Natasha Bedingford Field, Gabe Diction, Walker Hayes, Rosie Golan, Ademia, I'm just screwing these names up, Marshall, Trevor Hall, Kaylee Crosby, Kimberly Caldwell, and Tom Burrell, and many others. His big top 10 hit, Parachute, that he uh, wrote, became a British pop star. Cheryl Cole debuted his three words, which was number one in the UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. He also co-wrote Jesse James singles, When You Say My Name. Say My Name. He also produced Frankie Ballard's 2000 album, Sunshine and Whiskey. Co-produced Eric Paisley's 2014 debut, Eric Paisley, <laughs> and was a sole producer on uh, Ballard's follow-up album, El Rio. Has written and produced for some of the biggest names in the music industry today. Let's welcome my friend, Marshall Altman. You get to look at, look at you. How did, how did I do? Was, was, was my, did, did I do? Yeah, it's funny. The older you get, the worse your pronunciation becomes. It's really <laughs> remarkable. Like, I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, that was, that just. Hey, yeah. I got people don't want to listen that long. It, it's bad enough to go. Well, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, you know, I'm you know, you're, you're on episode. You're... <laughs> Couldn't you have thrown in, you know, Led Zeppelin? I mean, you were 
I mean, what year is that file from? Get it. Like, I didn't re write your cool. Wikipedia, man. Talk to your people. You think I came up with this? I just say this guy. Is that me or you that looks that old, by the way? I think it might be on my okay. side of the screen. Okay. I don't Look, know. I still have acne, so I'm young. <laughs> is that how we do it? No, I, get, I got stung by I got stung by a, a wasp yesterday. It's great. You might want to stop. It's like acne, acne so I look younger than you. Never, never. It's all right. I still got four hair sprouting up. Just saying. No, I'm just saying. I'm not saying. Just saying. Hey, look. Let's get what I'm supposed to be doing this podcast about is like no matter what you do in business, uh, you know, we're in some of the sales. You know, just like you had to sell, you know, your wife to marry you, which took a lot of selling, by the way. By the way, that's the that's the best that's the best sales job I ever did. <laughs> Not many. Oh, trust me, mine beat yours tremendously. <laughs> mine was into begging rather than selling. Yeah. Uh, if you're selling, you're applying for a job, or selling in some capacity, and we all live our lives. You know, being good at something, I, and this is kind of what I want to start, Marshall, that you know, in our lives, we realize we're good at something and we're better than others. I don't care if it's a spelling bee or dodgeball. You know something about yourself than you that you learned. And when you learn that and you're good about it, you become confident. When you're confident about it, you want to do it more. And obviously, out of the, all the accolades I just gave you, um, just because it's supposed to be an interview and not just us joking around on this, when did you realize, when did you realize that you had a talent that was different from others? You know, I, I look, I love to sing from the time I was a little kid um, and, you know, growing up poor for the most part, you know, I was always so focused on just finding a way to make money, um, but I found the most joy in my life from making music and I'm gr very, very grateful. I had a lot of supportive friends, you in particular, you know, who could have easily embarrassed me for, you know, trying to sing when I was happy um, or made me feel like the things that I wanted to do were, were as crazy as they were. Um, um, you know, I think any sane person um, would have told me when I wanted to drop out of college and pursue a career in music that I was out of my mind and several did. You didn't though, you know, and a lot of people that I knew didn't tell me I was crazy. They believed in me. So I think confidence, like anything else, is something that you learn. I don't think you get. I think you learn how to be confident. Did you, did you know that you were different from others, though, when you were younger? Did you realize that, you know what, I, 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 I'm good at singing or I, I, I actually am. This is something I enjoy and I don't only enjoy it. I'm, I'm good at it because it attracted people or did is yeah. it something I mean, you you. That's did you do something with it at that time? I mean, you'd like, I, mean, I, got, you I started my first band when I was in fourth grade. You know, I've been making music my entire life um, and finding positive reinforcement first from my family, because that's what family does. Did um, they support you with the journey of I, the talent when, when you were younger? Think, they... Yeah, my, my, my parents, my mom in particular, you know, got me piano lessons and guitar lessons and would come and see my crappy band play in the garage and you know definitely but the 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 meat of the meat of a realization that um what you love to do can potentially um feed your family when you're a musician it's a very scary prop it's a very scary proposition you know and knowing that um you know so much of it didn't matter how talented i was in this business you still have to get lucky you still have to make the right choices you still have yeah. to work with great yeah. people um I will say this, I, I still suffer with imposter syndrome now in, you know, in my fifties with what is a relatively successful career. Somebody, this is all I do for a living is make music and work with musicians. Yeah. I'm also a record executive too, on top of that now. But, um, you know, I think there's a, a, um, a wellspring of belief that we have in ourselves that gets filled up from positive experiences, meaning, I'll use a sports analogy. If you step up to the plate and the first pitch that gets thrown at you, you hit a home run, well, you're going to think that you can do that every time you step up to the plate. If you get up to the plate and, and strike out the first 10 times you've ever been pitched to, your level of confidence is going to decrease. I've been fortunate in that I got a few hits before I lost confidence and then learned that you know, it wasn't about luck. It was about hard work and commitment and um, building real relationships with people who believed in what I was capable of and I believed in what they were capable of. That has served me 
that has served my confidence through the difficult times in my career when nobody was calling me to produce records and nobody wanted to record my songs. I still had those meaningful relationships. Did you have to sell that dream to others? I mean, did you have to kind of, I know that you got the hits that you just said, and you know, it gave you a little bit more confidence, but as you were, like I just said, you- Great question, you knew that's a great question. I, you know, I think for, for the, in the creative space, it's less about the selling of a dream than it is about acting as if that premise, that dream, that desire to be something is a foregone conclusion for you. There's a subtle confidence that comes with um, believing in yourself. Right. Like, so you just, is. as much as I use that word sell, and it's not a, it's not a, you know, popular yeah, but word. But it is, a, it is selling. I mean, it, it is uh, really. Yeah. It, <laughs> you it, did. It is. I, I mean, mean we, knowing we you for so many for, years, you, you yeah. had to, you had yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. we have to sell to ourselves first. Well, without a doubt. But the confidence it gave you when I just said, most people don't realize the gifts they have when they're kids. Those are the same gifts they move when they're adults. Um, yours just happens to be, you know, being a great artist at what you do and with a phenomenal voice. And it made it a little easier because the confidence you had when you're selling that dream to others, um, being around it, um, it's a little bit easier just on the confidence side. And you just said there's so many people with great voice. It's like being an athlete. There's a lot of great golfers. There's a lot of great basketball players. There's a lot of great any in most sports. It's just the ones that believe their dream that, you know, they're not really having to sell it, but they are in some cases by how they, they talk to people. Um, when you go to any, you know, when you're being recruited, um, you know, my son being recently recruited, they're looking for the character of the person more, just as much as they're looking at the athleticism. You know, no one wants a cancer in their locker room. No. Uh, as you can see in, you know, the NFL and a lot of things. So when you moved from New York to California, because I said that in your bio, um, mm -hmm. what was your thoughts? Um, was it a great move? Was it something that you thought, okay, it's just gonna be some change of place or were you happy and content? And it was just we're going to be un, very uncomfortable for you going to California. What was your thoughts on when you? I mean, it, was, it was brutal. It was brutal. I, I left California on my I left New York rather on my 16th birthday. Um, you know, left all my friends, left you know my girlfriend, my all my friends, and we moved to Palm Springs first uh, for a few months, and that was an unmitigated disaster there. And thankfully, my mom found you know found Huntington Beach and we moved to Huntington Beach and I had a I had an epiphany of some sort you know I realized when I got to Huntington I think I think to, to cycle back I think in large part my mom wanted to move to California because she needed a new start and she saw that I needed a new start like I was sort of I'm, I'm a pretty smart person and um, I was using my intelligence not for the best causes when we were in New York and found myself in the same set of circumstances in Palm Springs. And when we got to Huntington, um, you know, I had a very big chip on my shoulder for a, for a while. And Huntington Marina High School was not the easiest place to be for, for a kid who grew up in New York City and in Rockland County. And um, I had a I had an epiphany. I realized, you know, I could I could. I could continue to um, to carry this this weight on my shoulder that really wasn't hurting anybody but myself, or I could put that weight down and I could, you know, I could be, um, you know, I could be a, a a good friend, an athlete. I could be part of a community where I had never really been one before, and I made a very concerted, you know, choice to not be an idiot anymore. <laughs> You well, you you chose. I mean, you were okay being comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, for a long time, you know, because I had this impression that you know I was I was smarter than everybody and yeah. I didn't need anybody, yeah. and, and you know the world was a hard place and I was going to take what I was going to take and everybody else could you know yeah F off for for lack of a better word and um and I just sort of started looking at things through a different lens. I mean, our friendship obviously we became very close friends and in high school and I don't know if I'd ever found myself in a situation where I had people that really had my back that way. I'm sure they did, you know, I had a very close Yeah, but there was some ignorance that went into our friendship. So I mean, I'm not gonna tell the story, but there's some massive ignorance that went into that of, you know, a new kid coming to a new school and, yeah. and being on a football team and some other person being a complete ass, um, yeah. making him feel uncomfortable. Uncom uncom and I, just the analogy there of when you put it into business in the business world, or, and I hate using the word, you know, selling or relationship, or whatever you want to call it, 
Yeah. Um, that's what happens. You go into an atmosphere where people are, are not nice. They come into you and they, they feel like they're better than you. And they feel like they have something to prove to you that don't, you can't come into my world because this is my world and I'm better than you. And, you know, you handled it tremendously. Um, though on the inside, I'm sure it wasn't that easy, but just like anybody that, you know, I'm trying to inspire to go out and do things that are completely uncomfortable. It was, it was a, a, a huge epiphany for me with you. When I look back on it, of when you're saying, you know, I didn't know how to sell myself. That was, it was a, it was a crazy time. And you really overcame tremendous, a tremendous obstacle. Cause you could have just said, you know what, I want to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. I'll move myself back to New York, but you came back the next day at school and you came back and you came back and it was, you know, kudos for you for, for having the wherewithal and which makes you successful in what you're doing now, without a doubt. Oh, that, that means a lot. Thank you. You know, thank you for being such a pain in my aspect. And, <laughs> but you know, I, what what I think I learned the, the 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 most valuable lesson I learned from my experience of moving across the country, f finding my way into Marina High School and and this being an outsider is that the only thing I could really control was how I reacted to what the world brought to me. You know, like the only thing we really can't control is our attitude. At the end of the day, po you know, call it positive mental attitude, call it stoicism, call it whatever you want. I think we are, you know, you can bemoan your circumstances. You can complain that you didn't get a lucky break. You can complain that people are being mean to you. They're not giving you a chance. But really the only thing we can control is how we react to the good and the bad. And I believe that we are not made by the best things that happen to us. We're made by the most challenging circumstances that oh. we find ourselves in. That is what made me who I am from New York City to Rockland to Palm Springs to, to Marina High School okay. to Nashville. Now, I am a product of the tough things I've been through. Sure. And all of those have given me the ability to um, you know, to sort of hone that sort of internal mechanism that says, I, I belong here. I belong here. I have something to offer in this situation to uh, a, a cause or a group of people. Um, and, and, and I think I learned about connection, really, about the, about the power of connection in, at, at high school with you, with all of our friends, about learning how to connect because you know, when we finally formed a connection, it opened up a sure. whole pathway to a real relationship for us. Not, not a transactional one, no. right? But just a real friendship. And I think you have been as successful as you are because you don't look at, you know, relationships aren't transactional for you, right? You're looking to add value to another human being's life and hoping that that interaction adds value to yours so now what whatever that value is whether it's a you know whether it's as base as a sales quota or or kpi or key performance indicators sure. it's still under it the, the 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 current under it all is about connection is about finding a way to connect yeah and you know i'd never really s sort of parsed the situation like i had to at marina where I wasn't going to be accepted until I was, until I could form some real connections, whether that was on the football field or in choir or in jazz choir or with the smart kids in, you know, AP classes. It was about finding a human connection. And just be clear, I was not in those AP classes. But, oh no, yeah. Okay, no. just making sure we're, we're absolutely you know, clear. We didn't that, have one class. You were, yeah, class, you didn't. You didn't know that. No. I had foods, I had foods, I had PE, I had, um, yeah, I was not attending the AP. What I did attend is lunch and hand you my homework. So yes. you could do that at lunchtime, the three minutes it would took you for me about nine hours. So I'm glad that, you know, that was a friendship that worked out definitely too. Yeah, definitely, definitely, it was reciprocal. Yeah. There was plenty of uh, reciprocity. <laughs> Symbiotic, I think is the word you're looking for. Don't there. use big kid words on the WTF. You had to explain KPI to half my audience. So don't, don't, don't be using days. five yeah. syllable words. Come on, jeez. You know, those, uh, no. those challenges that like you, you know, you were a challenge to me, <laughs> you really were. And I don't think I looked at it in those, in that frame, in that framework. Oh, Dan Manginelli and his group of friends are challenging me. It wasn't even that. It was, you know, the, this, I am on the outside. You were on the inside. And like anything else, we have to earn our way. Right. 
And whether you were thinking we got to make Marshall earn his way into our French, into being part of our friend, our friend group or not, we do earn our way through, sometimes it's through kindness, sometimes it's through connection, sometimes it's through standing up for yourself, right. not, you yeah. know, not taking any smack. Sometimes it's about being able to laugh at yourself in, you know, uncomfortable circumstances. But that was a very, I mean, I've, I've relied on my experience with you, with Marina, to get, to get me through some really challenging circumstances in my life. Like just the fact that I was an outsider and had to understand how to um, either be okay with being an outsider or learn how to make some connections taught me of some powerful lessons. And thank you for sharing that. Cause you know what? <clears throat> a lot of people feel that way. A lot of people feel that way and stop them from being, they get in their own way, stop them from being successful or stop from going out and even getting a relationship. I mean, I always say that, you know, action creates the timing and the actions that you took created the timing for us to be friends. And I think that a lot of people just stall in that and rather just kind of hide out and say, I don't want to do that because it's way too uncomfortable. So enough of the love fest after high school, what was, um, what was your plan after high school? What were you thinking? You're rich. That was it. I mean, honestly, that's, I, I mean, that's all, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we weren't, we weren't abject in abject poverty, but you mm -hmm. know, my split up, we didn't have a ton of money and, right. uh, you know, I was solely, I was just focused on making as much money as I possibly could because I saw that as, the, the path to happiness and freeze. so where did it change from just I want to figure out how to be because again you were one of the smartest guys in the school and I knew that you had your plans were probably going to be in the finance side or doing something that sure. way mm -hmm. um which we we'll talk about a complete yeah. switch roles yeah. huh you take the guy that doesn't know much and you put him into finance and you take the guy that knows everything and you put him into music I, yeah. I love that so were you obviously to make the money and that was your plan. And I, again, you thought probably it'd be finances. Where did it come to the fact that you said, you know what, I, music is my path and that my dream. And I'm going to follow that as my dream. But I'd taken a year, I would taken six months off. Um, I started, I started college as a, I took so many AP tests that I started college almost as a junior, right? Like at the end of my first semester in college, my freshman year, I was already a junior. So I, you know, I fell in love with a girl. I took the summer off I, and I sold perfume door to door. You remember that? I do. <laughs> fake, fake perfume in a briefcase, like slinging, you know, fake obsession uh, by Calvin Klein, fake polo by Ralph Lauren, just everywhere, all over Southern California, carrying a briefcase full of boxes of horrible, horrible cologne right, perfume right. everywhere from LAX to, to Watts to every swap meet. I would knock on a bank of apartment doors yeah. and I was great. I had, you know, I had 15 people. I remember you used to have that piece of paper where you had to have it had hands on it. Do you remember yep. that piece yep. of paper? I totally that remember piece of paper that. with hands on it. You had to cross off because the, the goal was, is their theory was if it touched 10 people's hands, one person would buy it. So it had like three, it looked like 3,000 hands on this thing. I would just be putting that, <laughs> I'm going to be throwing it at people just to get them to hold the hands. Yeah. So you have to cross off a hand every time you say, boy, I wish my oh. people had a plan like that. You give, <laughs> I wish that every salesperson I ever coached had a plan where it's just had a 10,000 hands a day is how much you had to get it into. That is, that is. Yeah. So, I, is you know, I learned all these lessons. A, I learned that selling that perfume was awful. Like it, it wasn't a good product. I was base. I would hold up at the, inter this is back before 9-11. I would hold up at the international terminal at LAX oh. and just take $20 bills off of immigrants, like people who were just flying in who had no idea what anything was. They'd come in, I'd spray them, and I would say $20, and I'd hand it to them, and they'd look at me, and I'd put out my hand, and they would just give me $20. It's I, I, I knew hard that, selling there, my friend. Yeah, I knew the airport security people. I would know how to avoid them. So when that ended, I went back to school, right. and felt like I made a fair amount of money and it didn't really make me any happier. And I was studying economics and I was doing very well in it, but I started a band because I was bored and wanted to have some fun. I was in college and we, there was a show we, we played, um, I can't I think Jesse Jackson came to speak and we opened up the show and I played for 5,000 people. And so how just did you find your bandmates? So there's goes back into like, you know, prospecting is what I like to call it. But yeah, I would always start singing. I would just be singing everywhere. You know, I was president of my dorm. So whenever there'd be a dorm event, I'd be playing piano. You know how I was. I mean, yeah. I'd be playing piano or I'd play guitar. And somebody asked me to jam and I started a, you know, just a little jam session. And one thing led to another. We brought in a drummer and 
a guitar player and the next thing you knew we were a band and we were playing gigs and I just thought you know my father's whole life has been about taking as few risks as possible and making the most sane choices and you know he wanted to be an actor his whole life he ended up being a federal judge incredibly successful in that space but he always was trying to act on the weekends and yeah. he wanted to retire early so he could study acting at South Coast Repertoire in Irvine and I remember having this feeling like you know and I don't know where they come from it's just very I remember it wait I could spend my whole life trying to make this fortune and the thing that I want the most is to sing is to be making music right and I said I'm not gonna wake up and be 60 and put together a band and play on the weekends I'm not gonna do it I'm gonna try and if it fails I'm wicked smart I'll figure it out I'll go back to college I'll 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 go back to college. I'll go to work for Danny. You were always my you were always my backup plan. Seriously, I always I'm glad I'm always your B wife. I appreciate that. I, like you're always I, my backup plan. I always that guy. I, right. If the bottom fell out, you know, I wouldn't be homeless. I could sleep on your couch, and I'd learn how to be in in real estate finance. You know, I always knew that was there. Now that's something a lot not everybody has, but right. that confidence and in and in turn your belief in me, really yours, because at that time we you were my you know, you were and still are my closest friend, right? So like, but but I didn't have a network of support. My mother was in her own world. My sister was in her own world. My father, when I went to, when I told him I was going to the Grove School of Music, he said, well, you better learn how to bake bread because that's the <laughs> only bread you're going to make if you get a degree in composition and arrangement, you know? So like nobody was really uh, supporting me. I don't know, I wouldn't have been yeah. indigent. You know, my father let me sleep on his on the, the fold out love seat in his study instead of one of the three extra bedrooms he had at his house. And when I asked him why he was making me sleep on this fold out love seat, he said, cause I don't want you to get too comfortable here. Yeah. You know? Isn't it funny as the reason I asked them the older questions, cause I know the later questions too, but isn't it funny the same people that supported you when you're nine years old that want to give you all these things to be successful and what you are really passionate about are the same people that tell you, you, you don't want, you're not, go get a real job. This isn't yeah. a job. This is don't follow that dream. But they, they supported the dream when it was cute. Yeah. But when it came to a passion that someone really wanted to do, the support changes. Well, wow, because yeah, you know, like anything else, my son wants to study, you know, he's going to study yeah. music composition. I would prefer that he studied, you know, microbiology or software engineering right. or, or anything other than this, because I want him to have an easier life than I did. But the, the truth is, you know, I would have taken this life if all I ever made was $25,000 a year. I still would be doing this if that's the only money I made. This, I've been, you know, I've worked incredibly hard to, to, to have this, what I think is a mid-level career in the music business, but I'm grateful for every day. Um, and, you know, at times, at times, you don't see a future. In, in when you're committed to anything at times you can't see the future there will be hard there have been hard times for me in this business there will continue to be hard times in this business just like in your business what's well, the only way you're going to learn to be better is for yeah. the hard times in the business you're going to know what, what doesn't work and man i found out a whole bunch that doesn't work but yeah absolutely I mean, yeah and, and yeah and having you know having that diamond i you know i i i, I tell a lot of the artists i work with like you have you think you have a lump of coal in your chest, but it's really a diamond that you are, you know, that you are hardening through your effort, through getting through the hard times. And when that, when you realize that's a diamond in there, that will get you through so much. When you realize that this thing inside of you is impenetrable, right? It's the hardest substance, the hardest organic substance known to man. Like you're building this through every rejection, through every no, that diamond gets more and more real inside of you. Um, that has helped me, that confidence that you gave me, the confidence that I got from some random show, from somebody that wasn't my mother telling me they love my voice or love my song. Yeah. The, yeah. the small achievements start to stack up and those are what get you through the rejection, that get you through the nose, that get you through the hard times. And sometimes it's also pig-headed belief. 
Sometimes it's also the feeling, getting to love the feeling of your head against a brick wall. Yeah. That's okay too. Like I've learned to love that. I've learned to love the, the, you know, it feels like I'm banging my head against a brick wall, but I believe in what I'm doing. So I'm going to keep banging until that brick turns to dust. Got it. The, those so, you are, go, so you go, let me just kind of, I, I just want to, go, go. Time, time frame wise, I want to make sure, you yeah, know. You know, I'm a wax poetic forever. So you yeah, just no, cut you off. It feels bad. People can be listening to this going, really? He's going to let him speak, please. But, you, you know, I don't want to make sure we're four hours of this. So you get a band. You finally, you get a band. Um, you actually get a record deal. Um, yeah. and you had to sell, you had to sell someone to give you a record deal. So when we go back to what you're selling yourself, just because of the music was good and the band was good, was it, and again, being around it, you know, an executive producer that I, um, being around it, um, how hard is the business to sell them that this is something they can make money with the record that you made? You know, it's a very strange, um, almost untraditional approach in the music business, the harder you try to convince people that you have the goods, the less they'll believe you have the goods. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a very strange business, you know, because like my dating is what it <laughs> <laughs> it <sounds like. laughs> because it's about the subjectivity uh, of taste, right? Like uh, I could make, uh, I could make the Beatles white album in here tomorrow and put it out and nobody might like it. Oh, I'm sure they would because you'd be, you'd be rising people from the dead. So that'd be awesome. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> sure, I, yeah of course. I mean, gr Grant, I would love to be able to do that. But it in this, it's, the, yeah. it's sort of the subtle confidence of owning who you are and what you want to be, being able to walk into like perfect example. I'm an A and R executive. I'm a I'm a you know vice president of A and R for for a record company. I can tell within the first 30 seconds of listening to a song, if it's something that I wanna keep listening to. I can tell in the first five minutes of a conversation with an artist, if there's somebody that I wanna work with. Now, what are those cues and what are the cues that I gave? I believed in what I was doing. Um, I believed in what I was doing, I asked, and I asked questions of the people who were interested you know, I ask questions of the people who should have been asking questions of me. Right. I would meet with the head of an A&R department and ask them about their label, about what they could do for me. I It was a foregone conclusion in my mind that I was a real artist. Got that it. I deserved to be in that in that arena with other real artists. It was, now, now how did I get there? Well, you know, that's an elusive thing. Like you, you know, when you, when you get there and believe it, you always have to move a little bit. You have to move forward incrementally every time because that belief is like the tide. It ebbs and it flows, you know? Um, when I was selling myself to get a record deal, it was about hustle. It was about, you know, A, it was about having great songs because I think I did have great songs at that time and that helped yeah. me get a record deal. But yeah. you also have to you also have to play the part. You also have to be... Yeah. the person yeah. that looks like they are successful, much like in your world, you know, if you walk into a meeting in a pair of, you know, khakis and a V-neck Hanes t-shirt like I'm wearing, that is not going to have the same effect as walking into a meeting with a, you know, with a custom made suit, you know, a Rolex and a really, um, a really deep and wide understanding and knowledge of what it is you are engaging in, right? I knew so much about music. I knew so much about the competition. I knew so much about performance. I would get on stage at the end of the day when I, that, that's what it always came down to. It always came down to a show. And I would believe, I would look out in the audience and if there were 10 people in the audience, I would see 10,000. You, you knew your craft. And that, that's kind of what I'm coming down to is you, you have more confidence in what you're doing and you're singing. And because one, you knew it was good. And two, you knew that when someone, someone can't stump you by asking you a question, let's say in sales or, and you feel like, you know, enough, not everything, but and enough. Um, you have the confidence to ask for business or in your case, you have the confidence to say like, I deserve a record. Deal. These are great songs. And no one's going to know more about the composition of the song or how it should be. Um, and that's, that's really, so 
with that, you got the record deal. Um, uh, record comes out. You have to hit the road. Now, that was an uncomfortable time. And by the way, that was my second record deal. You know that. Like, yes. we got the first one on Manginelli, um, yes. Manginelli Enterprises. You remember that? Alex has that headshot of my <laughs> curly hair. And I got dropped from that deal, as you remember. Well, see, obviously, I wasn't a good manager because you got dropped. You know, they let me make. They let me produce my own record, which was a huge mistake at the time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But that what's what's I have to tell about my failures in the record business. But I appreciate that bringing that up. But yes, you got you got the first deal, and then you got your second deal, and then yeah. you hit the road. So tell me about the uncomfortableness of the road, like for the first. Um, we were on the road for a year because I was out there quite a bit with you. So. Yeah. How was, how was it when all of a sudden, you know, the excitement hits and then you're on a bus? Yeah, you're on a bus waiting to play. And really, you get paid as a musician who tours, you are getting paid yeah. to wait. You play for free. You get paid to wait. But like anything else, you know, once the adventure of it wore off, I started to conceptualize how to build relationships. I'm still in touch with people I met. Sure. From our touring for those two plus years. I'm still in touch with those people. I saw Will Healy from Aware the other day. He was at my show at the Bluebird. Oh, wow. You know, I was looking to build relationships because I knew intrinsically that the connections we make, right, whether it's me making a connection with a booking agent, a bartender, a sound guy or girl, another band, those were things that. I wanted from my own humanity, but I also knew would serve the greater goals of my business. You know, like I wasn't selling myself to, um, I wasn't quote unquote selling myself to the other artists I met on the road, but we were all selling ourselves to each other. We were all trying to prove that we were belonged in this community together. We were all trying to add value to other bands lives other musicians lives other booking agents lives other you know other people we met along the road well, because what was we what was, adding value we would get value in return what was the jump then what was the jump from performing to producing because you, you man that's an interesting question i had tried so hard with the band and the wheels were coming off the bus you know i'd made some bad choices with how i was divvying up income within you know, within the band, um, some of the band members were just a little too reliant on the check they were getting every every month, as opposed to really digging in and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And before I went out on a tour, I'd you know I had been at Capitol Records before I got that record deal, and I convinced yeah. the A and R department there, the people who find new talent and make records, to put me on the payroll as a scout. And I eventually found Citizen Cope, mm -hmm. and you know. A buddy of mine named Lauren Israel pushed me into my boss's office at Capitol and said, Marshall wants to ask you for $5,000 to record some demos, to record some tracks with Cope. And my boss, Kim Bowie, said, yep, here you go. It's fine. And all of a sudden, the sum total of my experience, my life experience as a music maker, as an artist, as a software engineer, as a recording engineer, you know, as a composer, I found myself in a situation where all of those things could add value to someone else's experience. Like was I, Citizen Cope the tipping point? Was so that the, was, was, tipping, it, was the tipping yeah. point? Was that yeah. the artist that gave you the ability to say you know, I want to produce? Yeah, and it really was a moment where I where I felt a level of confidence that I had never experienced before. That I I when I was working with Clarence with Cope. Um, you know, I knew how to get him from point A to point B. I knew, um, you know, my experience struggling to be the front man in a band, which, you know, it, there were times when it felt right, but a lot of times it didn't feel right to me. And I just kept pushing through. Do you what, miss being that front guy? Yeah, I mean, I get to do it still. I mean, I'm, now I'm playing a lot of shows. I'm, you know, I'm no, 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 no. I'm just talking to you. Do you miss being the front guy no. in, front of, in front of the stage compared to the guy beh behind a board? Nope. I know. Um, this life, this life I have, I wouldn't be able to have. Right. If you were the know. front man in the band. I mean, I, I quit. I quit the Thorns because I had just gotten married to Leela, and I, you know, the Columbia was offering the Thorns a record deal. Um, Columbia, New York, was offering them a record deal, and Columbia, L.A., was offering me an executive position as an A and R person. And I thought, I don't want to go on the road anymore. I don't want to be. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to 
be without my wife. I don't want to be without Levi. And life changes and things change and, and that circumstance changed. And, you know, I, you have to now in my mind, help me out. Are you selling people that you're the guy that, you know, should produce them? Do you have to do that? I mean, it's staging your career now that's not where people are going to come to you and say, I want you to produce a record because I've seen what you've done and you're great at it. Early on after, you know, A&R and Citizen Kane, you got into production. So how did you attract artists at that time to saying, hey, I should produce your record. I'm your guy. You know, um, it's interesting. You're right now because my, my body of the body of work I've done, sure. I've been fortunate enough to have some success. That gets me entree into a lot of conversations. And mm -hmm. I typically have my, it's my choice whether I want to make a record these right. days. And I'm very grateful for that. But early on, what was it? What was it that you would have to? Would you have it's to enough, let them listen enough. to stuff? Would you, you have know, to tell them that? Like, let me explain why you need me, or what was? I'm just looking for for the audience and as well. If, if you're talking about selling yourself or selling something, what was it that you were able to tell them? Or again, you I give bring them a bottle back. of perfume and just put it in their hand. <laughs> <laughs> give me twenty dollars. Um, you know, I think it comes. I think it comes down to connection. I think right. you know, at a certain point. I had technical proficiency over this job, right? I knew how to record vocals. Technical proficiency is fine, but it's about, for what I do as a record producer, my job is to help an artist define themselves. That's the way I look at my job. So to in the early days when I was trying to get business, when I was selling myself to get a record, it was about A, making that connection, finding a connection point, whether it was a record I had made or another record that the artist loved and that I loved to being able to talk about the intricacies of that record, to be able to be thoroughly versed in what it was that needed to be done from the smallest technical aspects to the grandest vision of, the, of any particular artist's goals, to be able to talk about them and well, to help educate them, to help yeah. educate them about their own music, which is I've seen you do multiple times. I mean, you're educating them how their music can actually even sound better. And I think that you don't think think of it selling. And as a matter of fact, if I use the word salesman or salesperson to you right now, it's probably something you're going to think about that, you know, it's it's not it's not the best word to use. No, but, but, but it's an accurate descriptor. You know, the, I've seen you work. You ask a lot of questions. Right. You ask a lot of questions. It's selling right in whatever context it is whether it's making someone feel that making someone feel confident that i'm the right person to produce their record or making someone feel confident that you can help them achieve their financial goals in one way or another it's about it's about asking the right questions it's about actually listening and responding to the responding to the feedback that you're getting from the person you want to engage with. I ask a ton of questions. Right. I also talk a lot, but it's in response, right? I look at, you know, I look at successful relationships as music. You know, I play one thing, you play another. You play something, I play something. And soon we're making music, we're playing together and it sounds better than it would if we were alone, right? Every every successful relationship is an interaction like that for me. Yeah. Really. So you go, you you move once, you move twice, you you move again. So please, without being political, because I don't, we don't need to start that. Why did you move from from uh, to to Nashville from California? I think Tennessee no. is actually the state, isn't it? Nashville, yeah. not the state. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the years. The, the couple of years before we moved to Nashville were the most successful years of my career. I had a worldwide number one pop hit. I had three mm -hmm. or four platinum records, just okay. had work lined up. And, um, you know, my wife and I were considering selling our house in, in Studio City and moving closer to the beach and putting the kids in private school. And I and I had come to Nashville to make the, a record for an artist named Walker Hayes okay. and lived here for three months, like flew home four or five times in that span, but really lived here and saw something that I valued here, that music, that artists, that musicians had value in this community, that great songwriters had value in this community. It wasn't about stardom. It was about the actual value of the work that people did that mattered here. And that, that stuck in my mind. I went back to Los Angeles and, you know, um, I was having a hell of a run 
at that point, but I just felt uh, a, an empty, I felt somewhat of an emptiness in the connection I felt to the people that I, I was lined up to work with, not the artists, but um, some of the artists and some of the, the managers and the label people. And I realized if I stay here, I'm going to have to spend my life working with these people that I don't really know. I don't know and I don't find them knowable. So, you know, I, I took the opportunity at the top of my career to move to Nashville and start a new life. It wasn't it wasn't about the political environment. It really was just about looking at the future of my business and seeing, you know, and seeing that I didn't want to have to be the star. I didn't want to have to be the biggest producer in the in the game to have the life I wanted. I didn't want to be the biggest producer in the game because to get you know, in the music business, to get to a certain level, you have to subvert the people below you. You have to exploit the people below you in a way that has them doing your work, but getting none of the credit. So the and change, the change you took, equal, obviously, is equal stress and uncertainty. So you, you had this stress of, okay, we're moving my family, because that's stressful. You took him out of school, mm -hmm. right? And the uncertainty of, um, there's a lot of music being made in Nashville, and that's, that's the direction I want to go. But I believe, just as you're saying, is all those changes, if you think about the biggest ones in your life, they make you who they, who you are. Yeah. I don't think you regret any anything of being at the top of your game and yeah. making the change going nope, to Nashville. Not I mean, yeah, not at all. And I was very early to come here. I mean, I was one of the earliest people to move to Nashville from Los Angeles um, with – you know, a lot of people. So you're just saying you're the OG, so everybody. Should no, I'm not. I'm not the OG. There were people. Can, me, but can I not go to Nashville? Is what you're saying? Is stay out no, of. Nashville. I'm talking about the music. I'm just making sure. I want to be clear with you. I just want to know exactly what you're saying. P people typically found their way to Nashville when things had dried up for them in LA or New York. Got it. And I came here when things were kicking off for me, and I think that sent a message to the community that I believed in what Nash in what the future of Nashville was. I didn't move here to make country records. I accidentally have had, you know, a lot of success in country, but it wasn't what I was pursuing here. I was pursuing Nashville because I believed it was a great place for my community and would be a better place for my family right. to live than Los Angeles. Yeah. And you know, beautiful. I came it's beautiful there. there. I love visiting you yeah. there. There's there's yeah. no doubt. I've been out there so it's it, Blue Bird a couple of times. Um, speaking of that, when are you playing next? When are you going to play some live music next? Are you back at the um, Bluebird? Or you, I know you just played last week or so at the Bluebird Cafe. Yeah, I played a, uh, not last Friday, but the Friday before. I have a show. I have two shows before the end of the month at the Listening Room. Then I'm playing Bluebird on the Mountain, which is the biggest. It's like 2,500. Uh, so you do still play and still write, right? All the time, write all the time, produce records. Yeah. I'm still producing a couple of things right now. Um, and I have, um, you know, we're playing, I'm playing Baton Rouge, I'm playing Charlotte, I'm playing Maryland, like these songwriter rounds that right. I do with friends of mine, we're getting booked now. So I'm still playing all the time and I make music every day. You know, you can see yeah. there, you know, this place is lousy with guitars. There's a record being made across the hall. And I, this it's is just lousy record. in general. Yeah. I don't know about anything about yeah. guitars. But... Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I didn't play for a long time. I said no to shows for a very right. long time. And Good because it was it because you had to have this definition like I'm a producer I'm not an artist anymore yeah. well I'm an artist I'm not a producer or I'm an A and R guy and I'm not a right was it because you had to have a definition of who you thought you needed to be mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think that yeah, happens to a lot of people I, you know, yeah. I've lost some confidence I think right and, right you know, yeah um, I think that everybody thinks that they have to be this this and you said something early on that you're still waiting for someone to pull the curtain back and say aha. I knew it. I knew it wasn't the great Oz. I knew it was some guy doing the, and you're just not as good as you, because we all have the same insecurities that we're not as good as we are. You know, heck, I'm in this little studio with some WTF behind me, you know, trying to trying to scratch out some coin and doing a podcast with some guy in Nashville on the other side that actually is doing, you know, music. But everybody has that idea that they're not good enough or they're not smart enough or they don't know enough. And I think that you said that early on and it kind of goes in hand in hand of what your moves were and you can do your facet can be, you could be knowledgeable on all these different things and still produce, you know, pursue those different things. It doesn't have to be just a one trick pony that you only know this and you're definitely, you know, end up showing that over the years. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the one thing I've learned is that my experience as a performer makes me a better record producer. Right. 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 And a performer makes me a better A&R person. I, and I think 
you know, I, I think it's one of those things that we, for, you know, we're, we're now, like kids are taught, like, you're going to be an accountant, go be an accountant, make money. That's all you can do is be an accountant. You're going to be in mortgage yeah. finance, all you can yeah. The other parts of our lives feed. Well, you need to know the full stuff. I need yeah. to know everything about the business that you're in. Um, I don't yeah. we're running up against time and, and we could probably talk because we can continue our conversation afterwards. I'm looking at, you know, Big E over here and, and Big V on the board and they're stretching. We're doing these calisthenics yeah. now. You, got, you, well. guys done, you guys done? You guys done with my interview? What should we be listening to now? What music are you working on? Oh, here's action? what I want to say. I want to tell them the story about how when I was working the overnight at Trader Joe's for, for trying to union, I got fired fired from Trader Joe's store number two when there were only two stores because I was trying to unionize the store. Oh. I got fired. I got rehired. And as penance, I would have to work the overnights, right? right. 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. And you would call me <laughs> at 730. I don't know why I just didn't take the phone off the hook. I still don't know why I didn't unplug it. You would call me at 730 every day and say, get up, put your feet on the floor. It's going to be an amazing day. Let me hear you tell yourself that it's going to be an amazing day today and you're going to make something great happen. Go make music. Get out of bed right now. Go make music. That's what I want to talk about because that has stayed with me for so long. Those moments where you were relentless in your belief in me and in trying to get me to believe in myself. So, you know, like, yeah, you're, you're sitting there in a st blacked out studio with WTF neon behind you. But you know what? It all starts from somewhere. Yeah. You know? It yeah. all started my first sync on Party of Five. Yeah. Right. I remember that. That was the first yeah. time anything real had ever happened for the yeah. music I was making. So, was awesome. you know, it's, 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 I'll leave it with this Matt Nathanson, Little Victories. That's the song for everybody to listen to because sometimes you got to learn to get by on Little Victories. It's not the lottery ticket. Right. right. We're not looking for the lottery ticket. We're looking for the little victories that become bigger victories. And you won't even know. You know, I don't think I realized that I had a real career in the music business until I was in my 40s. I was just always expecting to be coming to work for you. You know, and at some point in my 40s, I realized, wait a minute, I'm going to survive. This is what I do. I'm great at this. So it's the little victories every single day. It's the little victories that turn you know, that make that diamond grow a little yeah. bit bigger that's in your chest. So I will leave it at that. If anybody wants to listen to a song, go back. It's a very old Matt Nathanson song. Go listen to Matt Nathanson, Little Victories. You can listen to Abby Anderson. She's got a new record out. It's called Sugar and Spice. Um, it's amazing. Sugar Spice, excuse me. The record's called Sugar Spice. You probably should know the records that you're promoting. Yeah. I'm just, I, mean, I butchered the names, but I didn't produce them early on. I'm just saying that people that you, actually you should know Abby's name. Yeah, and if you see me playing in your town, come out. I'm playing all over the place. Oh, yeah, please do, and it's a it's a treat. There's no doubt about it. Especially the singer songwriters. There's a couple of great songwriters that are singers that are that are absolutely awesome. Um, wrap it up against it, Marshall. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, I just really wanted everybody to kind of from a different one, just not listen to me on a microphone for for 30 minutes. But secondly, know that you know in life, having the confidence to do something that you really, really believe in and knowing your craft is where you have to get to. I don't care if it's you're a renowned record producer, an artist, or you're selling real estate. Um, you have to believe in yourself, your abilities, and that gives you the confidence to succeed. Guys, um, I really want your feedback on this one because this one I want to see if we want to continue to have some guests. We can have some great guests and I'll just leverage Marshall to get me people that you guys know that not knowing me, but we'll do that there. Tell me what you think. You can email me at dan at manginellegroup.com. That's dan at manginellegroup.com. You can get your videos and book at manginellegroup.com. Uh, be confident, guys. Marshall, thank you so much for your time. And as we go out from 1997, you're going to hear one of our hits from that those days. I thank you guys. Take care and make it a great day. Great interview, buddy. Awesome.